Hello and welcome back to Fantasy Nuts UK. I am delighted to be joined by a fellow Vikings fan after the weekend's exploits against the Buffalo Bills. Yes. It's Evan Brown. How are you doing, mate? You all right? I am good, man. Thank you so much for having me on. Definitely still riding the high of the dismantling of the Buffalo Bills, the, the battle in Buffalo. Um, yeah, it was great, man. Um, I, I mean, just lifelong Vikings fan. We're not used to winning those types of matchups. So it no. felt good to walk away with the W. Um, but yeah, how are you, man? Yeah, I'm, I'm still living the dream after that weekend uh, result there. But Evan is the host of Dynasty Debate Show. He's a featured writer for Dynasty Nurse, so he does know his stuff. And I meant to get that in at the beginning, but we'll get it in anyway. <laughs> it's great to have you on, man. How have you been getting on in all your leagues this year? Oh, man. Um, I'm in a lot of leagues. Not as many as some, um, but yeah, I'm in enough leagues where I'm doing really well in some and doing horribly in others. You know what I mean? So I think if you're in enough leagues, that's sort of the way it works. So I am in Scottish Fishbowl this year for the first time, which is awesome. I'm in the playoffs, which is great. Um, yeah, I mean, my team doing pretty well i think i just lost last week had a really bad weekend last weekend so lost you know how like in scott fishbowl they do the record but they also do the median so you're playing against the league average yeah. so i lost I, I think only my team only scored like 110 points last week it was terrible so um but in general yeah i'm doing really well in that i think i'm like 15 and 5 on the season or something um and then yeah and dynasty got a lot of different teams mostly um got several kind of strong contenders several that are pushing to get into the playoffs or in the playoffs already and then just one or two sort of rebuilding teams so kind of a nice mixture of everything really what about yourself so i'm also in scott fishbowl for the first time as you know we sort nice. of uh, connect a little bit in the uk chat but not doing as well as you so I i've got a foot in the playoffs i'm 10 and 10 but my points for is sort of saving me a little bit um, okay i'm around 9.50 ish in there nice. started off warrior bowl absolutely awfully but that's coming good back to a winning record in that so but like you say when you're in so many leagues you get a lot of good and also a lot of rough um <laughs> yes yeah, absolutely my, my best team i got left is for, funny enough um a dynasty team i'm nine and one but nice. i've lost zach Ertz, cooper cup this week and someone else but i can't remember who it is but yeah so oh, that no. <laughs> could go downhill rather sharpish i think that but is unfortunate it is that, that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes isn't it it is yeah we're like we mentioned we're both vikings fans eight and one could you have even imagined that in your wildest dreams pre-season no no, I, I mean, you're probably the same. I think a lot of us Vikings fans, you know, we've been scarred. We've been traumatized from a lifelong abusive relationship here. So we kind of always go into it like thinking and feeling the worst. So I was pretty pessimistic, to be honest with you. I was excited about O'Connell and, um, you know, the new GM and stuff like that. Yeah. But in general, I just am not a Kirk Cousins believer traditionally. So nope. I sort of feel like. If you don't have that elite quarterback, you're only going to go so far, you know? Um, so, yeah, I was I was sort of like, yeah, we might get eight or ten wins on the season, you know, maybe. Um, I certainly didn't think we would be eight and one. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's I think there's a lot of people kind of saying, oh, you guys are just really lucky this year because I know we played, you know, we played the Dolphins when Tua was out. Uh, we've played a lot of teams when sort of somebody's been banged up or something's missing. But that's football. You know, you can only play the people that are in front of you. And let's Absolutely. be honest, there's been, you know, look at the the commanders. You know, they beat the undefeated, you know, Eagles on Monday night. So, you know, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, that's with Taylor Heineke. So, like, what's the excuse in reverse? You know, I mean, I, I yeah. just think, you know what, you can only play the teams that are in front of you. And for me, it felt really nice because what I loved about I was kind of actually I really wanted Josh Allen to play last weekend because I was sick of that whole narrative I was like man if Josh Allen yeah. sits out and we win it's gonna be oh well you only won because Josh Allen wasn't playing or you know if Josh Allen is like you know hindered in some way but he looked you know yeah I mean obviously through the interceptions but he looked like he was slinging it he was playing he was playing hard he didn't look like he was limping off or barely able to throw or anything like that so I loved that we were able to hang with those guys yes we may have had a bit of luck of course we did but 
I said it on Twitter. I've said it all week. It's there's an age old saying. It's like you know, the harder wor- you work, the luckier you get. And I feel like they're putting in the work. They're working really hard. They're not giving up, which is under Zimmer. It felt like a lot of times we would just give up and we would hang our heads after a certain point. You know, if we're just getting beat up on too bad, it would just be like, oh well, there's always next week. Whereas I feel like these guys are kind of like never say die, and they've got that belief that yeah. they can always sort of come back. And to be fair to you know, Kirk, he did have a couple of big throws in that game, which was awesome to see. I'm not a big Kirk fan still. Um, I do like the new, you know, Kirk Thuggins look um, with the chains <laughs> and everything like that. That's definitely more likable than some of the stuff that we've seen. But it is nice to see, man. It's nice to see a positive vibe. It's nice to see, like, you know, a, a nice coach that you like that you believe in i never liked zimmer i was always frustrated by his demeanor by the way he carried on the way he would throw players under the bus and that he was just so negative and just you know his approach to football just seems so uh antiquated really for lack of a better term so it's nice it's nice it feels good i'm excited about the future i mean i, I can't agree with you enough we've gone from that sort of negative mindset with zimmer to everybody has bought in it seems as well with uh, Kevin O'Connell and Quezzi, who he questionable in the draft maybe a little bit, but it was his first ride doing it alone, you know, rather than part of a office. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I actually put a tweet on on Twitter about Kirk. I used a gif of a deer in headlights, sort of like that, when it matters. Two minutes, not even two minutes, I think about 45 seconds later, It was that Justin Jefferson catch where he just snagged the ball from the DB. And that was unbelievable, mate, when I I, I hit the roof, literally. Yeah. I mean, it was – I – I genuinely, I mean, I guess I'm too biased to not be able to, you know, say this, but I genuinely feel like it's the greatest catch I've ever seen in the NFL. Like, I love the OBJ catch. Of course I do. It's a great catch. But when you think about, I know it's not a playoff game, but how many implications are on the line, how big of a game it is, the fact that we're playing the Bills who were like, you know, the Super Bowl favorites going into this season, uh, it's fourth quarter, it's fourth and what, 18? I mean, it's it's the, the, yeah. the sheer volume of what's going on in the midst of that. And even if you you just watch it you watch it in slow motion and you're just like i still don't understand how he was able to do that because you know what i mean it's like the db's all over him the db's got the ball at one point he like rips it away from him it's just like it's un- it's unbelievable man so yeah absolutely i i love it even if you don't agree that it's the greatest catch it's got to be a top three or top five sort of catch um you know it, it, when you think about all the other factors involved it was amazing it was incredible i'm so thankful that i got to see it you know yeah no Absolutely. And even his demeanor afterwards, he normally does his little first down thing. He never, he knew the game was on the line there and that play sort of extended our chances, gave the ball to the official, ran straight into the huddle. He's, for me, Jefferson is the best in the league bar none. And his whole demeanor is absolutely fantastic. Like, yeah. I mean, uh, absolutely. And you're probably the same as me because I remember, you know, growing up as a kid, I got to see us draft Randy Moss and I got to see Randy Moss like in his prime. You know, I'm probably a little bit older than you. So I got to see Randy Moss like destroy the Packers and, you know, all these kind of me. It was just so great to see Randy Moss. And I always thought, man, I'll never see this again in my life. You know, like this is incredible. And I'm not saying he's there yet, but man, like he feels like that level of a guy. He feels like the kind of guy that you're like, we're never out of it because we got this dude, you know, we were always there's always a chance because we've got Justin Jefferson even with like Kirk Cousins who I don't think is like a top five quarterback or anything like that so um yeah it's it's incredible man it's awesome to have I just wish like you said I think we talked before show I do wish you know um Quessy hadn't necessarily gift wrapped Jameson Williams to them or uh even Christian Watson who I am a big fan of it would have been lovely to have either of those guys as like the number two behind Justin Jefferson that would be that would be mouth-watering to say the least. I mean, look at what the Dolphins are able to do with a Tyreek Waddle combo. You know what I mean? Right now we yeah. have probably the best wide receiver in the NFL, but he's kind of our only real alpha wide receiver. So if defenses want to, they're going to start just double teaming him and just focusing on him constantly. Not to say he won't still get his and he won't still be awesome, but there is a certain amount of limiting that you can do and kind of, you know, play, taking away some of those big plays when you've got two guys on the field, Waddle and and Hill, there's just nothing you can do. And we've seen that all no. season. There's just nothing you can do. You can't afford to double team both of them or they'll just run all over you, you know, or, or whoever, you know, like T- Hawkinson would just go crazy on you. So you, it, you're really just screwed if you have in any way sort of a, an offensive minded coach, which obviously Kevin O'Connell is. So I really wish we had done that. Maybe we'll do that in the next draft, but we'll see how that goes. 
Hawkinson's a great addition. You just mentioned in there. We will get back into some of those players shortly. Let's crack on with a little recap of week 10 anyway. By position for fantasy is what we're here for. QB1 on the week, back to back, Justin Fields, two weeks on the spin. Not only being QB1, but topping 40 points. He got 40.4 points this week. He's up to QB4 on the season. He only completed 12 passes out of 20, but he was near on 150 rushing yards. Again, using his legs for good work. Four touchdowns again. Absolutely phenomenal. Josh Allen, he was only the QB6 on this week. We obviously both watched the game. He still leads the way overall. It was a bad week for him by his standards. Patrick Mahomes is only 3.1 points behind Josh Allen now after a QB2 finish again. 32.1 points this week. So you do Superflex rankings for Dynasty Nerds, which is a massive platform, obviously. Um, Matt Ryan. Now, I've got a lot of shares in Matt Ryan in Superflex redraft leagues. What do you see from him now rest of the season? Yeah, I mean, I think the rest of this season, I think he'll be the starter unless he does get injured. I think that there was some weird sort of shenanigans going on with Frank Reich, for lack of a better term. You know, um, it's weird. It's it's just really hard to know exactly what goes on in those buildings because word on the street was that it was sort of hearsay who was pushing, um, getting Sam Ellinger involved and letting him be the guy. And, you know, but then he kind of sucked. And then Frank Reich caught the heave ho. And then Jeff Saturday comes in and throws Matt Ryan straight back in there. And the offense looks a lot better. Obviously, Jonathan Taylor's back, things like that. I think Matt Ryan, yeah, will be solid the rest of the year. I don't think he's necessarily like, you know, always going to be a top five quarterback or anything crazy. But I really like Michael Pittman Jr. in general. Paris Campbell has created an amazing connection with Matt Ryan. Yeah. And if Jonathan Taylor can stay healthy, we know he's one of the most talented running backs in the NFL. So, yeah, I mean, it seems like from the way they played against the Raiders that they're not just here to like mail it in and try and get a high draft pick they seem like they're playing and they're trying to compete you know obviously we'll see how it goes but i i think he'll be a solid qb2 for you in most matchups you know yeah and jeff saturday fuck you bro because you could have let me know with more time so i could actually get him into my lineups this weekend but let's move on to running back because you just mentioned jonathan taylor there jonathan taylor i didn't think this I was starting to think, sorry, not that I didn't think, that this day would happen again this season. He was the RB1 this week, 24.3 points in PPR leagues. He's still down in the lowly depths of running backs at RB27 when he was the consensus 101 in redraft, dynasty, even super flex leagues. He was usually the first off the board uh, from running backs. He had that 66-yard rushing touchdown. He looked a lot better this week. Um but Mike McDaniel now, he got both of his RBs a top 10 finish this week against that woeful Bears run defense. Miami have obviously gone into the bye. Um, Jeff Wilson, he's up to RB21 in PPR overall. Only 11.2 points per game, though. Obviously, coming from San Francisco, he wasn't utilized as much as he has been these last two weeks. So... Wilson had doubled the carries this week to Masert. Um, he's clearly taken the lead role fully now. Is he an RB one the rest of the season for you? Um, I think he, I think he definitely could be. I think we've already touched on it. You know, it's a combination of multiple factors. Mike McDaniel's a really smart offensive coach. We've seen that already. He knows how to get the most out of what he has. He's utilizing that similar sort of run scheme that he would have run in San Francisco. Um, and the and the the clincher of it all is like we said, as long as Waddle and Hill are healthy and playing, like defenses are screwed. You know they cannot load the box and try and really stop the run. I mean, some of those running lanes, like there was people, you know. I think there was somebody on Twitter who put out like a picture, a video of like, you know, one of the, you know, Jeff Wilson's runs and they stopped it. And they're like, you know, six Jeff Wilson's could run through this running lane right here because, you know, they're just really, they are, they're in a tough spot because two is very accurate. You know, he's very quick at getting the ball out. Yes. He doesn't have the strongest arm in the world, blah, 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 whatever. It doesn't matter when you've got two absolute yak monsters in Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. So, you know, I think as long as those guys are healthy, man, just based on, on the options that the defense is going to provide you with, like he's going to be a, at least a borderline RB1, or he's certainly going to have those boom RB1 sort of weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I love Jeff Wilson anyway. Obviously, 
between him and Mostert when they was in San Francisco, it was who's going to be healthy kind of thing. But talking to Mostert, because I still love him, he's absolutely explosive when he's on the field from a real life NFL uh, perspective. And he does give deliver those fantasy goods, doesn't he? But what's his value now for the rest of the season? I mean, I think he's, he certainly, you know, certainly want to hold on to him if at all possible, especially if you're in any sort of dynasty leagues for this season, if you're a contender. Um, I, I think, yes, it looks pretty clear that Jeff Wilson is going to be the leader of the doghouse, but I think that, you know, Mike McDaniel is a smart guy. He knows these guys really well. He knows how good they are and what they can do, but he also knows their limitations. He's aware of, yeah. you know, the injury history of both of them. I don't think he's going to give either of them 30 carries a week or anything like that and just try and grind them down. I think he's got his eye on the playoffs. He's got his eye on trying to make a run. So it wouldn't surprise me if Jeff Wilson, yes, is maybe the leader in that backfield, but it's more of like a 60-40 sort of split. It's not that he's getting 99% of the work and most of it's unusable. So if you're in any sort of like deeper multi-flex leagues, you may still be able to flex most of it because again, like we've talked about, man, they just know how to put up points. They're going to be able to put up points like crazy and – you know, you just never know who's going to get the touchdowns. You know what I mean? It could be Mostert. It could be Wilson. Um, you know, neither of them are getting crazy targets, which obviously you'd love to see that if they were. But at the same time, again, it's just one of those high-powered, fun offenses that you want pieces of. So I think you definitely want to hold on to Mostert unless you're trying to rebuild or something, in which case see if you can trade him to either the Jeff Wilson manager or somebody who's really desperate for running back and try and, you know, polish a turd as they say and make a you know tell them about how like hey look it's a high powered offense look how many points are scoring all that kind of stuff um in redraft yeah it might be a little bit tougher you know what i mean if you're sort of in that borderline trying to make the playoffs and you need every like bench spot to count i think he's definitely worst case scenario one of the most valuable handcuffs you can have right now but Again, if you're in a 12 team redraft league, I would really want to hold on to him if I could because again, like you said, there's an injury history there with both parties. And if either of them goes down, man, the other automatically becomes like a league winner for sure. And um, I've not actually looked at their schedule right now, but they've got one of the easiest running back schedules left in the NFL. I know they've got San Francisco, who are a good run defense. Um, possibly maybe yeah, the Rams I mean, have got to play as well again. But... They get the Chargers in week 14, who are one of the nicest, juiciest matchups, you know, yeah. which is lovely. But then they do play Buffalo, then they play Green Bay, and then in the championship week, it's uh, New England. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag there. But again, one thing, I mean, when it's a borderline offense, I do really care a lot more about schedule. With an offense like that, the way they're humming at the minute, I'm not really yeah. worried about any team that they're going up against because like you say even if it's i mean the worst sort of run defense is san francisco or the titans or something like that they're still gonna like have to stop waddle hill you know how are they gonna do yeah. that you know what i mean so, so many there's so spread many out. pieces to the puzzle. yeah if they're spread out trying to stop those guys they may still get a couple of goal line opportunities even you know i should have clarified sorry i meant to get you to the playoffs i think they've got the 49ers and then one other game before week 15 so for me, I'm holding most of that. And then if you need to drop him before week 15 um, starts. Yeah. No, you're right. For someone I mean, to bring week. in the hot hand yeah. off the waiver wire, you know, their bye week's yeah. gone after this week. You know, absolutely. He's, fle yeah, no, they're bye he's week flexible this week. to cover Houston, other buyers. Yeah. Which they could exactly. both for like 200 yards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, crazier things have happened. But. Let's crack on with wide receiver. So CD Lamb turned up to the party this week. 38 points. It was a career high receiving yards for him, 150. His first 100 plus game this season. Two touchdowns. Now, for me, it was the volume that impressed me the most. 15 targets off Dak, 11 receptions. He was CD Lamb that we know and the CD Lamb that we draft so highly. Absolutely fantastic performance for our fantasy teams. Now, you had Christian Kirk at wide receiver four, 31 and a half. Watson at wide receiver three, 32 and a bit. Jefferson, obviously, at wide receiver two, 35 plus again. Four wide receivers over 30 points this week. It was phenomenal, wasn't it? And it's proving them zero RB drafters even more correct for this season. Every but season. <laughs> every season. Let's talk a little bit about that Christian Watson breakout. So... Obviously, the forty percent target share. He caught four of eight. Three of them was touchdowns for over a hundred yards. 
I don't think it's sustainable at this level. Of course, it's not sustainable if he has to catch a touchdown on 75% of his catches, you know. Um, but what are your thoughts on Christian Watson going forward the rest of the season, mate? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think Christian Watson was one of those characters, wasn't he? He was so divisive in the offseason, even after the draft. There was either, it was like Marmite, you either loved him or you hated him, you know? Yeah. I personally loved him, so I was sort of in the minority there, I felt like. Um, and everyone's sort of like, oh, it's just one game. It was a boom game. Who cares? But, you know, ultimately, this is what they drafted him for. Yes, you can't expect three touchdown performances every single week. That would be crazy. But what I want to remind people is that this is the first game of the season where he's actually been healthy enough and involved enough to play a majority of the snaps like yeah. every other game this season he's either he was re, he was dealing with hamstring injuries in the preseason he was dealing with hamstring injuries at the start of the season he missed a couple games or had to leave early a couple he then had a concussion he came back he had another con like it's been a crazy start to the season for him he came from a lower level of competition of course it was going to take a little bit of time to hit the ground running but this is why they drafted him this is why you know i and others like me were excited about him do i think he's going to be like the wide receiver two or three every week for the next you know six weeks and when you're fantasy championships no not necessarily but i think he has a really nice matchup this week so it'll be really interesting to see what happens now you know now that he's had his breakout game let's not forget romeo dobbs still out of the picture alan lazard is there but he's a little bit beat up he's been in and out you know we obviously i mean they've really only got they just let amari rogers go <laughs> you know he's had like eight yeah. doubles in his games i mean he literally can't hold on to the ball to save his life so you know at this moment in time they sort of need him and if he's able to put together even just another decent performance not a 32 point performance but just even another four or five catches 60 70 80 yards it would be nice to get another touchdown you know um he'll have a little bit stiffer of competition against philadelphia in week 12 but i i honestly think you know I'm excited about his future. I really am because I really believed in him. I think he does a lot of things really well. Yes, he was raw. Yes, he needed to work on some things, but that's going to happen when you come up from a lower level of competition. We, we seen it with when Adams was there in Green Bay. Now, I, I wasn't a Watson believer as much as you, obviously, um, with him being so raw, joining Aaron Rodgers. But like you say, he's healthy now. He's played a game like that and he's got volume coming his way. But we've seen it with Adams when he was in Green Bay as the clear number one. How does this impact Alan Lazard? I don't think it really does too much, to be honest with you, because they they both have really nicely complementary sort of skill sets, I feel like. If you look at the, even just their routes run and things, they both average around sort of similar amounts, 30 or 35% in the slot. 60 or so percent out wide so they can kind of move in and out depending on what they need whereas alan lazard is more of your possession sort of receiver i feel like whereas christian watson is more of the big hit you know boom bust sort of longer deeper routes we saw that in this last game um but also he can be used out of the backfield you know so he can use in jet sweeps things like that because of his athleticism yeah. and his speed so i don't think it impacts him too much i mean i think aaron Rodgers. yes he's had a down year yes he's not looked that great i don't know the future i don't know how much longer he's in the league for but as it stands right now as far as just pure talent pure skill he's still a top 10 quarterback top five probably even in as far as just pure um ability you know to read defenses to yeah. distribute the ball things like that so you know that's a real bonus you know when you've got a guy as yeah. accurate as aaron Rodgers who can just drop the ball exactly where it needs to be that helps make up for a lot of the deficiencies in route running or deficiencies in whatever it may be plus like you said they only have really two guys at the moment. I mean, Sammy Watkins is Sammy Watkins. You can't really count on him for anything. Um, you know, Romeo Dobbs is out of the picture. Amari Rogers is out of town. Uh, you know, Robert Tunyon, he's just, he is what he is. He's not going to be commanding 10, 12 targets a game. So no. yeah, I think that, you know, wheels up for Christian Watson. We'll see how it goes, but I think it is a positive. Definitely. Lovely. And let's crack on with tight end. Finally, Cole Komet. Now, 23.4 points on the week, another two touchdowns. He scored five in his last three games. I said on a five-yard rush fast action Friday, on Friday just gone, I was intrigued by Komet's usage after such a poor start. So weeks one to seven, he was the tight end 33, most likely dropped in all redraft leagues. He was 12 of 18 for 148 yards. Now, weeks eight to 10, 
for the last three weeks, Cole Komet is your overall tight end one. He's caught 11 of 15, 125 yards, but it is then five touchdowns. He's up to tight end 12 overall. With tight end being such a crapshoot, yet again, you've got Kelsey Andrews gap. Is he a tight end one the rest of the season? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think if you or I went and volunteered in the NFL, we could be potentially tight end ones the rest of the season. It is such a dumpster <laughs> fire. So I absolutely think he could be a tight end one the rest of the year, man. I mean, you've got to think, like you said, it's a, it's a low passing volume attack but it's a concentrated you know what i mean like he's only you know fields yeah. is only throwing the ball 20 25 times a game but a large portion of that pie is going to commit it's going to mooney and then there's very small little bit for, left over for everybody else so that's going for him plus we've got to remember you know and i was thinking about this recently it's funny because obviously forget about monday night football but uh, the rest of this year everybody's been like man nick sirianni is an amazing coach he is so cool he's brilliant he is just a great coach why can't we have more nick sirianni's people forget that like his first year in charge about halfway through the season people were literally and i'm not just talking about like random people I'm talking about like analysts and stuff were like man this guy's a joke he sucks as a head coach what is he doing doesn't know what he's doing can't even figure anything out he's like an absolute like what a terrible hire all this kind of stuff so we're too quick to like write people off sometimes especially new coaches coming in learning something especially if they're a first-time head coach so you gotta i mean if you look at even just like the way they tried to use fields and tried to run the offense the first couple of weeks yeah. it was a disaster then they went on their bye week and i feel like they kind of had a meet you know a come to jesus moment and they just realized like we need to change some things around we need to actually utilize the strengths of the the quarterback that we have and the receiving room, the the room of, of talent that we do have. Yes, it's not elite talent, but let's actually play to the strengths that we do have. And since then, it's been a night and day difference. You know, it's a much more explosive offense. Yeah. They're scoring a lot of points. Uh, yeah, it's not what we want in fantasy for like as far as like he's not flinging the ball 50 times a game and all that sort of stuff. But it's certainly something where, yeah, absolutely, 100%. If, I, you know, Cole Komet, probably easily a top 12, top 10 you know, tight end the rest of the season just based on how horrible the tight end landscape is. Yeah, without a doubt. Let's just touch quickly on our boy, our new boy, TJ Hawkinson. So he's tight end five on the year in PPR. He's been the tight end five since he's joined us. Obviously, only two games, week nine and ten. But he's had a basically a third of his targets in the last two weeks. Ertz is out. Um, Andrews is banged up. Obviously, Ertz ain't going to play again the rest of the year. He was the tight end three. Where do you see TJ Hawkinson finishing? Well, I mean, he, he's almost like de facto tight end three at the very worst, you know, because if you look at it right now as it stands, you know, you mentioned he's behind Goddard, who's just gone on IR, and behind Ertz, who probably isn't playing the rest of the year. He was only in just a normal sort of PPR, you know, not tight end premium or anything. He was only 0. 0.4 points behind Dallas Goddard and about 2.6 points behind Ertz, or he would have been in third place already. Um, and he's only about seven or eight points behind Mark Andrews. So if Mark Andrews isn't fully healthy, um, you know, or if Mark Andrews has a bit of a blip or, or Isaiah likely starts taking some of those target, you know, tar uh, red zone targets away from him, something like that. I think he's almost yeah. a de facto tight end three on the rest of the year, maybe even tight end two. I don't think anybody can take it away from Kelsey unless he gets injured. But um, I would say, you know, he's probably tight end three. He could, he could potentially be tight end two because I've highlighted on my recap show the last couple of weeks. Um, yeah, I, I was a little bit skeptical about how much are we going to use the tight ends because last several years we just historically haven't really used tight ends that much in our offense. Yeah. And Kevin O'Connell didn't really use the tight end much um, in L.A., even with Higby and stuff like that, who's not like a phenomenal tight end, but he's, he's better than average. Um, you know, they didn't really pass much there. And so I was like, I don't really know how much we're going to really use this guy. But, man, he's got, you know, monster target share both weeks since he's been there. He seems to be a really integral part of the offense. So, yeah, even in Dynasty, I, I was saying, man, I would be, I would definitely be paying up to to get him on the squad. I feel like he could potentially become a difference maker because we're we're scoring points, we're utilizing him, and and when you just talked about it, somebody who was unusable for the first six or eight weeks is now all of a sudden a top twelve tight end. So anybody who can like make a difference for you is worth paying up for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's had nineteen targets the last two weeks, decent yards both weeks as well. He seems to almost be that what they might have hoped feeling would be almost like the safety blanket for Kirk, you know, when shit's getting real, just quick, give it, give it TJ. Like, do you know what I mean? And obviously PPR leagues, we love that. We absolutely love that. 
But yeah, I let's mean, move on. Tight end premium sorry, leagues as well. Yeah, without a doubt. When you get a few extra, a uh, little bit more bang for your buck, 100%. Um, but let's move on. So Rockstar Rookie came back last week with Matt Cullen, who joined me. Now he touted Olave for the Rockstar Rookie, the rookie number one on the week, who in turn shit the bed. So he was the wide receiver 60. I went with the slightly less bad George Pickens, wide receiver 26, saved his day with a rushing touchdown, 14 and a half PPR points. Now, which rookie stood out for you in week 10, Evan? Oh, I mean, we've already talked about it. It has to be Christian Watson, you know. I, I think his performance alone probably would have made him that. But it's the fact that he's had such a rough start. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's been literally in and out of the lineup, not even playing full games. Sometimes, you know, starting to play and just being benched almost, it seemed like, um, to the point where, you know, I was able to get him in Scott Fishbowl this week, you know, because some, like, Scott Fishbowl, yeah. everybody's rostered, it feels like. <laughs> but, yeah, like, he was even on, like, people had picked up, okay, give you an example. In Scott Fishbowl, in my division, Samori Toure had been picked up and Christian Watson was still left out there. So that's how little people were thinking of Christian Watson at this stage. Um, and that's, again, just especially in Dynasty, just said, let's just pump the brakes on calling someone a bust halfway through their rookie season, you know? Like, look at Paris Campbell, you know? Yeah. Um, so let's just have a little bit of patience with these guys. So for me, it has to be Christian Watson. And that is a reason why I absolutely love taxi squads, but for rookies only. Because you can leave him there until you see this kind of week. Do you know what I mean? Before having to make that roster spot for him. Yeah, but, it kind of gives you that little bit of a buffer to stop you from dropping yeah. someone out of annoyance. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But who is going to be the rock star rookie for week 11? So for me, I've tried to go outside the box here because I feel like we're all excited about Chris Olave. We're all excited about, um, you know, a couple of these stud wide receivers who've had some really good games, you know, Drake London's and stuff. So I've tried to go a little bit outside the box here. I'm going to go with just a, uh, I'm actually going to give you two for one, uh, both running backs, both rookie running backs here. And it's Brian Robinson Jr. and Isaiah Pacheco. So the reason being is kind of a combination really of with running backs, as you know, opportunity is king. So if they're going to get the opportunity, that's that's always a good start. Brian Robinson, to that point, just had 26 rush attempts against Philadelphia. So yeah. you can't get much more opportunity than that. Uh, Gibson got a little bit beat up. I don't expect him to miss the game, but I believe he kind of rolled his ankle a little bit in that game. He hasn't been getting a lot of rushing attempts anyways. And as we kind of had already alluded to or mentioned earlier in the show, he gets the absolute pleasure and joy of taking on the Houston Texans. The Houston Texans are giving up points to the fantasy running back like it's going out of style. They literally are first in fantasy points to the running back. So, I mean, even Brian Robinson with his like pedestrian three yards per carry could still have an absolute smash week against this Houston and Texans. Um, and then Isaiah Pacheco, he plays in a much more high powered offense. Obviously, the Kansas City Chiefs, he's slowly been taking over that backfield. They had a really rough matchup against the Titans, which they are the number one defense for you know rush DVOA. You don't want to go against the Titans. So it was understandable that he had a bad game. Then they went on their bye week. But when he came back last week, he outsnapped Jarek McKinnon 56 to 38 percent. CEH only had six percent of the snaps. And against, um, you know, Los Angeles Chargers, who we've talked about, are, you know, third uh, it, for giving up running back points to the to the points to the fantasy points to the running back position. Again, really nice, really juicy matchup because against the Jaguars, who they're a pretty good matchup as well. They're not even as good as the Chargers. He still had about 18 rush attempts, I believe, for around 84 yards. So with a team like the Chiefs, I don't think when they're making their game plan, they're like, we must stop Isaiah Pacheco. I think they're probably yeah. worrying about Kelsey, you know, and um, to be fair, you know, obviously Joka has got involved here. So Kadarius Tony seems to be up and running, but Nico Hardman still banged up missing practice as it stands. Juju is still out in the concussion protocol. So it could be a really nice combination of them needing him to step up. Plus it being a nice juicy run defense. So I think both those guys could have a really good week. I absolutely love Brian Robinson and what he's come back from is just remarkable. I've mentioned it here, mentioned it on Fast Action Friday lots of times this season. I loved him when he was coming out though and not just his play, obviously he's an absolute bulldozer, 
but everything he's about, you know, he stayed loyal to Alabama. He didn't try and run out the door when there was the likes of obviously Najee Harris there. And, you know, before that, he was a five-year player there. Yeah. Damien, Damien Harris. I mean, he was behind loads of guys. Yeah. Like he was behind Josh Jacobs at one point, wasn't he? And As a rookie, yeah. So, now, I, 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 yeah, I love Brian Robinson and I love that shout for this week. I am going for one of those wide receivers who has done it this season already. So, but it, it's a funny one because New England, now I'm going Garrett Wilson, but New England are very good against wide receivers. You know, they rank third. They only let up 23.1 points to wide receivers. They're also very good against running backs. But in week eight, Garrett Wilson put up 15 points on New England. Now he's coming in fresh off the bye. It's a divisional matchup, which if the Jets win, they could be top. If they lose, they could be bottom of the division. That it's got shootout written all over it for me. And um, maybe a low quality shootout with the quarterback situations on both teams and the wide receivers on both teams. But there's nobody else there for the Jets. Elijah Moore is obviously sort of an outcast there. And Corey Davis has been banged up, etc. But yeah, I'm going Garrett Wilson again. Why not? Could be a Nerf gun shootout. <laughs> yeah, a shootout with <laughs> Not a very gun. deadly, but a lot yeah. of fun. <laughs> yeah, still fun and still potentially very good for our fantasy teams. <laughs> but I love Garrett Wilson. On. To be fair, yeah, I, I I was a big fan. He was um, one of my most rostered rookies before sort of the redraft season came along, and yeah, I do like Garrett Wilson. But let's crack on with these bye weeks. So. Uh, from the outset, just looking at the teams, it might not seem it, but it is treacherous again. So we've got Seattle. You've got Geno Smith. He's obviously been a serviceable QB1 since grabbing him off waivers. Ken Walker, the rookie sensation. He's coming into his own up to RB16 overall. Lockett's tailed off a little bit. He's the wide receiver 10 on the season. But you've got DK Metcalf now catching up. Wide receiver 15 in PPR. Then you've got Tampa, who have been underwhelming. Brady... Leonard Fournette or Rashad White, who had 100 yards in Munich. But Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, Julio Jones, whoever's healthy at wide receiver. Um, Mike Evans is the wide receiver 12. Now, this is the big one. Miami Dolphins, we've spoke about them enough on today's show. But two are 20.4 points per game this season. Tyreek's the overall wide receiver one. Plus Waddle's the wide receiver six. The run game we touched on earlier two top 10 RBs this week just gone. Wilson, Jeff Wilson, since arriving, he's had two RB1 finishes. That is a lot of players for a lot of teams. Jacksonville as well, the last one. Trevor Lawrence, Evan Engram, Zay Jones, they've all had little whiffs of good this season. Travis Etienne, he's up to RB12 now. The last few weeks, he's been fantastic. He's approaching a 1,000 scrimmage yards on the year. And Christian Kirk, he had a couple down weeks in the middle of the season. He's the wide receiver seven overall, 16.1 points per game as well. So to summarize it, six of the top 15 wide receivers on the year are not playing this week, plus some other guys. But And, and then you've got Cooper Cup, who's on IR, probably others. Um, Jamar Chase, he could still be top 15, I reckon. They're out as well. So over half of the top 15 wide receivers are not playing this week. Who are you going to miss the most across all of your teams, Evan? Because it's an absolute minefield. Yeah, I mean, oh, it's painful. Like, I, I'm a, it's the Miami team. It has to be Miami for me because I love Jalen Waddle. I've got him in several dynasty leagues, and he's obviously been amazing for the year. Um, and then Tyreek Hill, I've got him in Scott Fishbowl. So I need those points, man. <laughs> You know, it's not going to be, it's not going to be fun, you know, without Tyreek out there ripping it up. So yeah, I mean, it's going to be tough without those Miami boys. And I've got Jeff Wilson, you know, in lots of rosters and, and dynasty. And, uh, you know, that's been a delight these last couple of weeks as well. So yeah, it's going to be tough without the Miami fellas. I mean, I've got the Brady, Mike Evans stuck in Scott Fishbowl. They haven't been cooking it like I'd hoped, but they're still missed. Oh, sorry. In Bowl, I have them. I've got Tyreek in the Scott Fishbowl as well same as you but in the warrior bowl i traded for travis etn so he's missing i draft i picked up zay jones off the waiver wire one week so he's there and missing obviously mike evans and brady i said 
Christian Kirk, I got missing. Evan Engram, missing. I, I, I've had to go on the waiver. I missed out on Christian Watson by uh, $3. I bid 58 So I'm actually yeah, only yeah. have... Overnight, I only have two active wide receivers on my Warrior Bowl team. Ouch. So let's hope for um, a bit of Ben Skoronic or someone like that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but... Let's jump into the overall number ones predictions for week 11. So at quarterback last week, Matt, who I mentioned earlier that was on, he went fields for back-to-back and he got fields as the number one. I went my home, so it was super chalky, both of us, who finished as the QB too. Now, for week 11, I'm going chalk again a little bit. A little bit. He's the QB one, Josh Allen, against Cleveland. He was the QB six last week on a bad day with 22 points. Another week since hurting his elbow. So another week of recovery. I think he was limited today in practice, so they're getting him right. Bad weather in Buffalo, but we all know he uses those legs pretty well. And I just think it's a bounce-back week against Cleveland, who are middle of the road. You know, They're pretty average against quarterbacks. But who are you going for week 11 QB1? Yeah, I mean, I I agree with your pick a lot. Like, I really, I actually thought about taking Josh Allen because I do agree that he's due a bounce back week and Cleveland defense doesn't scare me. It was the weather sort of that put me off. And also I was trying to not be too chalky because I've got a couple of picks in here I think are fairly chalky, but I'm actually going a little bit lower, shooting for the ceiling here. I'm going Justin Herbert and... Really, it's been so frustrating and disappointing this year for me as a Justin Herbert stand. I took him 103 in the Scott Fishbowl, so I took him in the first round of Scott Fishbowl. He's had you know no Keenan Allen all year. He's had last several weeks no Mike Williams. He's been throwing to like DeAndre Carter and you know made up guys that we don't believe are real. Um, it, it's just been so sad, you know, so frustrating. The play calling has been really, really sad, really subpar, and they've had some offensive line um, issues. But fingers crossed. They're playing Sunday night football against the Kansas City Chiefs, which has absolute blowout, like amazing shootout potential. Um, Plus, apparently now, again, we all know head coaches are big fat liars, but apparently Keenan Allen and Mike Williams are doing individual drills. They are getting back in this week, and there's a chance, quote unquote, that they could play. Oh, yes. Thank you. Exactly. That is exactly right. So my point is, if, if, Williams and Allens are, are back. I'm going to say Justin Herbert because Kansas City does allow the 11th most fantasy points to the quarterback. They allow the second highest QB rating in the league. And in his games, the in their games that they've played with Justin Herbert against Kansas City, Mike Williams is averaging six receptions, 98 yards in the last four games. Keenan Allen's averaging seven receptions, 74.7 yards per game. So again, you get my picture. I think if they're healthy, if they can make that game and play, I'm going to go Justin Herbert having an absolute bounce back week, getting like, you know, a nice 303 sort of week. Um, But if not, if they can't go, if they're both out, I'm going to go super boring and say Justin Fields because he's been on absolute fire. He's playing Atlanta this week. And, you know, I mean, that's let's not overthink it here. Yeah, absolutely. Back to back to back. But that is my boy Gibbo, who actually is from Belfast as well. You. So. And we, we've been saying it a lot, you know, we talk fantasy day in, day out, NFL day in, day out. like, And we've said it for weeks. Justin Herbert is missing Keenan Allen. And even when Mike Williams was there, one good week, one bad week, one good week, one bad week. Keenan Allen is, the, you know, he's kind of like the, the level, isn't he? He's the, con- the constant. That is the word. Keenan Allen is the constant for Justin Herbert. Um, but yeah, Gibbo, great. Great that you're tuning in, mate, as well. So, running back. Now, week 10, I went with Saquon. He was the RB5 on the week. Matt went with CMC. Both of them players had plush matchups. Obviously, Elijah Mitchell came back. CMC ended up the RB11. Who are you going for for the RB1 for week 11, mate? Yeah, so I'm going to follow in your footsteps here, and I'm going to go for Saquon um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, A, it's just been so much fun to watch him this year. It's been so great to see him finally back to himself. Um, plus, he gets an amazing matchup. Again, he's playing Detroit. They're the 27th in Rush DVOA, which if you're not familiar, I talk about Rush DVOA a lot on my podcast. I love the kind of advanced statistics where you look at like efficiency and things like that. So DVOA just stands for Defensive Adjusted Value Over Average. So it's kind of like really smart people looking and breaking down every play, every game, and then basically assigning like how good 
each team should have done based on what they faced and then how good they actually did. So the 27th, there's only 32 teams. You can do the math. It's not great. They're giving up the second most yards per game uh, to the to the running back position, so 160.9 yards. And on top of all that, Saquon is one of the very few absolute bell cow running backs that we have left in the league. He's averaging 22 rush attempts per game at 4.7 yards per carry. I mean, he by himself is averaging over 100 yards per game, and the Lions give up 160. I mean, he could literally have 150, 160 yards and a couple touchdowns himself this week. I mean, for scrimmage yards, I wouldn't put it past Saquon going 200 plus this week. It's on me. I should have told you probably. I usually go by like PPR mostly because that's the most leagues I'm in. There's no one else in New York, is there, that can catch balls really? You got Darius Slayton. He's he's the wide receiver one. Like, yeah, I do like Darius Slayton to be fair. But yeah, I mean, they're, I they've shown too, yeah. their hand that they want to run the ball. They want to build up. Um, you know, they've they've been working all season to build up Daniel Jones. You know, confidence again and things. And I think it's working. I mean, he actually is playing a yeah. lot better than he has in the last several years. And it's been a dumpster fire in New York for years now. So I think they're working on just making it a, a, a basic, easy offense, um, getting Daniel Jones' confidence back up and seeing what happens. I mean, and it's winning and it's working They've, as long as Saquon stays healthy. So, yeah, I mean, I think he could easily be the RB1 this week. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I've gone quite chalky as well. Derek Henry. So the matchup ain't great against Green Bay for running backs, but they do leak a few fantasy points here and there. So... They've let up 100-plus yards three times, 20 points twice. But for me, it's more about Derek Henry. So he's going to be coming in for a big week at Lambeau. Potential snow game, I'm told, as well. It's actually snow out there in Green Bay now in yes. Wisconsin. And at least the Yeti. The Titans, they decided to completely flip the script last week with Ryan Tannehill back, and they threw the ball. Derek Henry suffered because of that. Um, obviously, bad weather. Let the legs go, isn't it? Derek Henry. Yeah. I have Derek Henry and Scott Fishbowl, so I hope you are right. I hope he has like six touchdowns and 450 yards. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to the Alvin Kamara stat line that ruined my yeah, Christmas. Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> right. Wide receivers. So week 10, Matt went AJB. He got hurt. I went Juju. He got hurt. Who are you going for at wide receiver, Evan? Oh, I mean, there can only be one answer. There can only be one answer when two Vikings fans get together to talk fantasy football. I'm going to be a complete homer and say Justin Jefferson here. I just feel like, I mean, he's just on a roll. You know what I mean? And I'm sort of one of those people that like, I feel like in fantasy football, we overthink things sometimes, sometimes too much and we galaxy brain things. Justin Jefferson is so clearly, you know, a, to me, he's clearly the wide receiver one in the NFL, but he's so clearly the wide receiver one in this team. I mean, there's no chance. Yes, I appreciate that Diggs is a good cornerback and he gets some interceptions, but I think that the Cowboys are going to be able to score on the Vikings. So I also think that they're going to have to go back and score on um, on the Cowboys. And I think Dalvin Cook will probably have a massive game, um, but I do think Justin Jefferson is going to have a good game and He's just one of those guys that I'm like, man, he's on fire at the minute. He's it's NBA jam rules. You know, he's on fire. Give him the ball. Let him take off from half court and absolutely slam dunk it. Mate, he, he absolutely overshadowed Stefan Diggs last week. He is going to put Trayvon on ice this week. I couldn't agree more with you. I, I, I love it. I love the matchup with, for him against Trayvon Diggs as well, who is good. He gets yeah. interceptions and things like that. But he also has a lot of weak points. And Justin Jefferson, you can't have weak points if you're going up against him. Exactly. I mean, let's not forget was um, Kadarius Tony absolutely roasted Diggs, you know, for like 160 yards or 180 yards or whatever it was. There's one good game that he had for the Giants was against the Cowboys. So I really think that, you know, absolutely. I, I think that he's a good DB and he has good games, but he's not elite. And Justin Jefferson is elite. Justin Jefferson is one of those guys. I'm never worried about putting him into my lineup. So he definitely doesn't scare me off. At Gibbo again, Trayvon Diggs is the Tyler Lockett of DBs. He'll either get a pick or get torched. And yeah, I couldn't agree more, mate. Well, since he's, playing, he's playing against Kirk Cousins, he probably will get a pick, but he'll also get torched yeah. multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> mate, that's brilliant. I've gone T Higgins at Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh have been leaking points left, right and centre to wide receivers all season. 
T Higgins is actually the wide receiver three on his own team. If you go by PPR points, we all know he's not. He's the clear number one with Jamar Chase out. He's had more targets, receptions, yards, targets per route run, bigger target share, more air yards than Tyler Boyd. Pittsburgh are letting up the second most points to fantasy wide receivers over 35 a game and the most touchdowns to wide receivers in the league. So that's one of the only columns where Higgins is behind Boyd. I think he's got three touchdowns. Boyd's had four on the season. And T Higgins is uber talented. How he dropped out the first round of that draft. He, and they got him at 33 with Burrow at one, the Bengals. Honestly, unbelievable. But I'm going to see Higgins at Pittsburgh. I mean, to be fair, they could both have a really good game. Um, you know, because honestly, if you break it down even further, the Steelers are second worst against the slot receiver. And obviously, Tyler Boyd plays primarily out of the slot. They're actually ninth worst against the outside wide receiver. So it could even be just both of them have a great game. So I absolutely, absolutely agree with you. It could be a monster. And Joe Burrow has supported all three for 100 plus yard games on one day. I think Higgins was 97 yards actually that day. But the other two, Boyd and Chase, both went well over the 100 on the, the same beautiful day. Man. He is. He's one of my favorites. Oh Let's my gosh. Can you imagine end. if we had Joe Burrow? If we had Joe Burrow instead of Kirk Cousins, that would just be. Uh, oh, what could be? No, I, I don't think I could imagine it. I think I, I, I would, if that ever happened, I think that's my final day. I, I'm done. I just wish we could like trade, you know, Shanahan has this obsession with Kirk Cousins and with quarterbacks like him. I wish we could trade Kirk Cousins for like Trey Lance or something like that. That would be incredible. That would, that would be absolutely unbelievable as well, especially after a few years. Now, you know, he, he, he got hurt. It was such a shame, but... He's got a few years' experience now because just like he says with Christian Watson, obviously they came from the same college, didn't they? He was raw. And I, I can't wait to see Trey Lance do Trey Lance things in the NFL. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see what Justin Fields is doing. And yes, absolutely. He was more polished, you know, as a, as a, he was more polished as a passer than, than Trey Lance, but he's not, we're not wowed with what Justin Fields is doing as a passer right now. We're wowed with what he's doing athletically. So I think Christian, you know, Christian Watson has been smashing it, but also Trey Lance guys from these small schools that are these athletic freaks, they do have a pathway to relevance and also dominance in the NFL. And it's exciting to see. Yeah, absolutely. But let's crack on with tight end. So in week 10, Matt went super chalky. He didn't even give an explanation to why he picked this person. And I can't blame him. Travis Kelsey. Obviously, Cole Komet, he got another two touchdowns. Kelsey was still the number two. I went TJ Hawkinson. I went for the homer pick. He was a tight end seven on the week. It wasn't a bad shout. But I've, I've kind of learned my lesson now. You just need to pick a tight end who goes against the Seahawks, who are on a bye, or Arizona. So I'm going for George Kittle because they're at Arizona this week. He was on a hot streak till last week when they faced the Chargers as well. 18.2% um, percent, sorry, target share, 21.9% targets per route run. So he's getting lots of volume still. It's going to be a bounce back against Arizona this week. They are awful against tight ends. 16 points per game allowed. The most yards, 778. Not just the most yards, the most yards by 100 to Seattle. So they're 100, point, 100 yards out in front allowed against tight ends to everyone else. We've all seen George Kittle have them weeks as well. The most receptions, 75 they've allowed on 90 targets and the joint most touchdowns with seven. It's a really easy pick for me, George Kittle. And I, mean, I love him. He's to, a great person. Argue. My main argument would be uh, Kyle Shanahan. So... I just, I can't stand him, man. Like, I really can't. Like, I don't ever want any, like, pieces of his offense because of that. It's like, this. see, I said this about CMC as soon as he got traded. Everybody was, not everybody, but a lot of people were like, oh, my gosh, sky's the limit. He's going to get 100, you know, he's going to get 100 rush attempts every game and 50 targets. And it's going to be amazing. And I'm like, oh. Like, Kyle Shanahan's that kind of guy, man. He's like, he, like he did last week. He's going to be like, I know. Let's give Elijah Mitchell all the carries, you know, he just, he is like, honestly, he is such a fart sniffer. Like he loves the smell of his own farts. He's too clever for his own good. He literally will do it. I feel like just to spite everybody, he'll be like, you know what? No, 
George Kittle's blocking all week, even though he's one of the best yeah. tight ends in the entire league. Or no, do you know what? I don't like Brandon Ayuk's haircut. He's not having any targets this week or something stupid. <laughs> so I agree with you. He absolutely could and should have a smash week. So I agree. It's a good pick. I actually thought about that as well. I'm going Dalton Schultz here um, against our Minnesota Vikings and partly because kind of tying into that narrative that I kind of gave you already that I think it could be a shootout. Um, Minnesota is allowing the 29th most yards per game so as in you know third worst you know what i mean they're allowing just loads of yards per game Dak is obviously getting healthier yes they eventually lost the packers last week but they were able to he was able to throw the ball able to move the ball on them um you know he's really like schultz schultz is a real favorite target of his he had seven and eight targets in the last two games now that Dak is kind of really healthy again and it's a 47 point over under i mean it's close to a 50 point over under so i think vegas even expects some <laughs> ross dooley season i think vegas even expects some points to be scored here and i really wouldn't be surprised if cd lamb has a monster game um, and if Dalton yeah. Schultz has a monster game as well, like it wouldn't shock me at all. So I've tried to go a little bit less chalky. Uh, I didn't want to cheat and just say Travis Kelsey because <laughs> I feel like that's the low hanging fruit. Um, or even saying Mark Andrews, you know, coming back off the bye. I tried to go a little bit deeper here, but I think Dalton Schultz has a chance. I absolutely love Dalton Schultz. I've got him in quite a few dynasty leagues as well. And uh, I, I, I knew I, I held him in redrafts as well. People were dropping him. I grabbed him off a waiver wire. Like, that volume and that connection that he had with Dak. Yes, he's not a fantastic tight end for NFL purposes, but for fantasy football, we love it because Dak will go there and go there a lot. And when they both got healthy and like you say, you know, he's using him against seven and eight targets. I love it. Gibbo, I think he's on the Jamesons tonight, possibly. <laughs> Ross Dwelly season, but... Ross Dwelly season? No, oh, come on. GTFO. <laughs> But that is about it, Evan. And thank you so much for coming on, man. I've had a great time. Yeah. Let so everybody know. Let everybody know where they can hear you, where they can read your work and all that good stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple. If you're on Twitter, you can catch up with me at FF Evan Lucian. So like Revolution with my name, Evan, Evan Lucian. Uh, you can follow, you can check out the show. I do a dynasty show, dynasty debates. It's on all the major podcast listening platforms. So whether you're on Spotify or Apple or Google Play, Stitcher, whatever it is, it's out there. And um, at the moment in season, I do two episodes a week. So on Tuesday mornings, I drop a solo pod that is just a recap of all the weekend's action. So I try and give like an actionable piece of advice from every game at the weekend. So whether it be specifically a snap share or maybe some PFF stats or something like that, talk about trade targets, something, just one or two little nuggets from each game focusing on dynasty um and then on thursdays i always drop an episode so for example tomorrow morning uh an episode with alex caruso dropping with a guest so every week there's a guest and we just talk about the matchups that are about to come up so we'll talk about 11 week 11 matchups but we also talk some trades some general dynasty trade theory things like that so yeah it's i really love it it's a great show definitely check it out if you're looking for some more podcasts and then as far as written work i do work with dynasty nerds so i'm a featured writer over there at the moment i do a weekly flex article start sit flex article um for your dynasty leagues and also do some super flex tight end premium rankings over there so yeah that's pretty much where you can find any of my stuff if you so choose yeah evan's a great follower as well very funny if you couldn't tell by tonight's show definitely hit him up on twitter he's available all week all year round pretty much <laughs> but yeah so too much some might say yeah yeah probably the same with me but that is it for tonight. As always, thank you for tuning in. If you haven't yet, come and catch it. It's on YouTube straight after this finishes. As always, good luck in week 11. I hope you get that one step closer to the playoffs unless you are facing me. Go Vikes. Exactly. School. <laughs>